Father, today is an awesome day because you are the center of it. And you are the purpose and the reason for all that we do. And so, Lord, I pray that today as we go through these really challenging chapters, that uh, you would help us understand what you said to Isaiah and what you are saying today to the world. Father, we have, uh, we're, we're seeing uh, in our own lifetime birth pangs that can really be identified as birth pangs. And uh, it's an exciting and somewhat scary time for those who don't know you. For those of us who call upon your name, Father, it's exciting also, but it's, it, it lends to urgency about our families and our friends and those who we care about. So, Father, help us to understand what you have to say today in these chapters of Isaiah. And, uh, Father, we just bless you and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, we are going into uh, what I consider to be the, the, the oracles. I think I talked about last week was chapters really uh, 13 through 23, right? Or the, or, the, or the oracle chapters. There's 10 Gentile nations that are going to be addressed. And so we're looking at the end of chapter 14 right here, 15, 16, and then 17 and 18. Sorry, I just need to put that. Chapter 17 and 18. Uh, and these are basically three of the oracles. And then there's going to be seven more. So when we get through chapter 23, we'll, we'll be done with those, and then we're going to move into another section. And so oracles are a burden or a heavy message or a difficult thing to say. And so uh, when we get to uh, this last part uh, of uh, Isaiah chapter 14, uh, there's some really important things that we want to look at. What does the verse 28 tell us of uh, chapter 14? What does it tell us? The oracle came in the year Ahaz died. Okay. In the year that Ahaz died. It doesn't say that the oracle came after his death. It just says it came in the year that he died. Okay? So we have some markers. If you were going to divide up this book, chapter 6 happened in the year that King Uzziah died. So you would know from chapter 7 to chapter 14 is the reign of Ahaz, okay? That's what you're seeing. And so um, uh, we, we kind of can recognize that, that there are some very subtle little timelines that are going on. Um, who was King Ahaz? What kind of a king was he? He relied on himself. He relied on himself. He was definitely... I'm just going to put a little King Ahaz thing here. Was a committed apostate. He did not follow the law. He did not obey the covenants. He was not interested in that. And he is the one who pulled Judah into deep idolatry. He was really big on idol worship. And we see that in 2 Kings, I'm just going to put this out, 2 Kings 16, 2 through 4. So this is this is kind of the reference to that. So we know that uh, in chapter 7 and chapter 9 with Ahaz, God wanted to give a miraculous sign. But Ahaz instead was saying, no, I'm going to rely on the pagan nations around me. I'm not going to rely on the covenant of God. And so it's very interesting that there are, there's a sign at the beginning in chapter 7, and there's another sign in the end chapter 14. Okay? 
So the first sign was talking about chapter 7 and 9. Just put there. Chapter, these two chapters were about Messiah. Right? And they were very well-known uh, prophecies. And now we're going to get to this really challenging little prophecy, if you will, at the end of 28 through 32 of Isaiah 14. So it kind of seems, if you, if you think about how God is working, what, is, what do we know that God consistently does in every single prophecy that he has given thus far? What has he done? He's done two things. Uh, the first one is that he's brought a judgment, but then he also brings a what? What does he do? We've seen so much in those prophecies about Christ. He brings an out, if you will, and way out, an answer to it. Uh, you know, turn and follow me. You never see it. Even if, if, as we get through these oracles, there's going to be times when the Lord says, but I will deliver. And his hand is outstretched. His hand is outstretched. He's, he's, yeah, he's that's it over out. and over. Yes. So, so we see that even though the beginning of King Ahaz's reign was uh, very, very idolatrous, and, and God was reaching out to him, giving him a sign, I will give you a sign, I will save you, I will deliver you, you're not going to be overtaken. And, the, and the, uh, if, if you do not believe, you will not last. Right? If you don't follow through this, you're not going to endure, you're not going to survive. So we see that being spoken about 7 through 9, and then we see in this part, we see an, a final, if you will, prophecy to the reign of King Ahaz. Okay? Now it goes beyond that, just like these prophecies go way beyond King Ahaz, obviously. But this is going to do the same thing. So, <clears throat> verse 20. Eight. It says of chapter 14, it says, In the year that King Ahaz died, this oracle or this burden came. Do not rejoice, O Philistine, Philistine, all of you, because the rod that struck you is broken, for from the serpent's root a viper will come out, and its fruit will be a flowering serpent. Those who are most helpless will eat, and the needy will lie down in security. I will destroy your root with famine, and it will kill off your offspring. Off your survivors. Well, O day, cry, O city, melt away, O Philistine, all of you. For smoke comes from the north, and there is no strangler, straggler in his ranks. How then will one answer the messengers of the nation that the Lord has found in Zion, and the afflicted of his people will seek refuge in it? Okay, so what the heck is that about? <laughs> okay. So this, let me just tell you that one of the important things about prophecy, you have to, you have to line it up with the overarching, bigger picture of all the other prophecies, okay? So you're not going to have some kind of one-off prophecy unless it is being explained. It will be explained in the scripture why it's like that. So uh, why is he saying do not rejoice? Why? Why, why would they not rejoice? Think about what he's saying here. He's telling them, don't be happy because the rod that struck you is broken. Now, what would the rod be? Think about the other times that the rod is talked about. The rod is a picture of discipline, right? The rod that struck you is broken means that the discipline of that rod has stopped, okay? And so uh, then he starts explaining what that rod is. From the serpent's root, a viper will come out. So he's telling them, do not rejoice because it appears <coughs> that your adversary, let's say, is broken. That's basically what he's, they're saying. You're not going to rejoice over this, but you think you may have won. You think the king is dead. You think the circumstances have changed. But the reality is they have not. It's not going to happen that way. So, Genesis 49.10 
this was to me very uh, striking. It's talking about the rod will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Okay, so the rod will not depart from Judah until Shiloh. Now, how, how does uh, uh, what does that say? Who is the, who, what, who is the capital of Shiloh? I mean, Shiloh is the capital, I'm sorry, of what? Samaria, Shiloh, right? So the rod does not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. So what, there's two kingdoms. There is Israel. And then there is Judah. The rod is in Judah. And we're going to see a description of what this rod does. So I'm just jumping out there taking the deep plunge. Who do you think the rod is in this context? The rod is Ahaz. Oh, I wouldn't have thought that. Okay, now think about what it's, it's talking about. Do not rejoice, it says, because why? It says, do not rejoice O Philista, all of you, because the rod that struck you is broken. Because if he's dead. Because he's dead. Okay, or he's about to die. Mm -hmm. This is in the year that he died. He probably hasn't died yet, but what has happened to Ahaz? He's diminished. He's not in power. So the rod in Judah, that rod that's promised until Shalu comes, and there's some other connections here, because 715 is the year that King Ahaz died. So 715 is the year of this part of the letter, or this letter, Ahaz dies. Now, uh, what also happens in that time? 722 is when Israel is taken by Assyrian. And we're going to get we're going to get to some of this as we go to these next few uh, verses. But that would appear to who is this? It's the oracle of Philista, the Philistines, right? Mm -hmm. Who have been the arch enemy. When did we first see the Philistines come on the scene? We saw them in Genesis, really, with uh, um, Abraham. But who was Goliath? He was a Philistine. He was a Philistine. They were the arch enemies of Judah throughout all the time that Judah and Israel existed. So they have been in the, uh, historically, they have been in the losing category until the death of Ahaz. After Ahaz dies, this is really the beginning of the end of, of uh, uh, Judah. They're starting a real rapid decline at this point. They are no longer the big man on the, on the block as far as their ability to have victories. And so they see this, this rod they has is decline. The decline of the nation. And even though Hezekiah was a great king, they were still in decline. He still had the enemies, the Assyrians are right there on his doorstep all the way to Jerusalem. That is not the sign of a victorious and powerful king if he could not keep his borders protected. Okay? So that's the rod, is, is uh, Ahaz. The serpent, and this is another thing I had to do a fair amount of research on, 
and probably what I'll have to do is um, send that maybe separately. I'll have to see how I can get you all that information. It was just too much to put on my one page. But the serpent, is a picture of Hezekiah or the uh, government or God's uh, chosen kings starting with David that Davidic line so Hezekiah is the immediate servant, okay? Um, and he follows Ahaz. So if you think about how this is following through, it, it's, it's definitely a little bit challenging. From the serpent's root, a viper will come out, okay? Now, the serpent is also, I think, the viper. What does a viper do? What, it's a snake that does what? They're kind of high in the ground and they come out and they strike at you. There, it's an unexpected strike is the picture of it. And I think this is definitely Hezekiah. Now, here's the thing. It can also be interpreted that these are Assyrian kings. The reason why I don't think that that is correct is because of Genesis 49.10. And because of the way that the rod is being used, who implements the rod? God calls Assyria his rod of judgment, right? It is God that sets up these rods of judgment for purposes uh, pertaining to his prophecy and the future of these people. And we're going to see that when we look at the oracle of Mo Moab. So the, the viper... Uh, <coughs> is Hezekiah, and he defeats King, she uh, he, he defeats Shennacherib. Hezekiah defeats Okay, so the serpent is more likely the Davidic line. The viper is more likely to be Hezekiah. Okay? The rod is going to be Ahaz. Okay? But after this, after the rod is broken, the nation is going into decline. That's, that's the picture that we see. Okay. So, uh, the fruit of the flying serpent, okay, is the next part. So the flying serpent is going to be connected to the kingdom of David, right? That's who it's going to be connected to. And that would be the ultimate kingdom of the Messiah. So I believe the flying serpent is a picture of Messiah. Now that is very end times and uh, uh, some of the verses that you could look at is Numbers 21.9 and John 3.14. Now, I could be wrong. I'm just going to say. But if you look at this, this event in line with everything that we've studied in the prior 13 chapters, and even chapter 14, when you look at all of that, the way that this is put together as, this is what I think it means. Okay, so, just gotta, just kind of follow that sort of right there. So, um, it's sort of like the rod is a picture of God's power. It's not God's power, but it's a picture of it. And the rod is a picture of, the, uh, of a type of Christ or the judgment to come uh, 
the, the rod might look like it's broken, but it has still got some things coming out of that rod that continue on with that covenant. So if it was a rod of the um, Philistines, it would not have a future. Okay, that's the other thing about this. When you look at how it's laid out, uh, there's the rod, there's a serpent, there's the viper, there's a flying serpent, and each one comes out of the month prior to it, and you wouldn't see that in a Gentile prophecy. They would not be reproducing themselves with a certain outcome. So that's the other reason why I think it's talking about that in this chapter. Uh, uh, so the fruit of the viper, from the serpent's root, a viper will come. That's in verse 29. So you have something producing something else, and this fruit will be a flying serpent. And so the result of the flying serpent is what we see in the next verses. So we see uh, those who are most helpless will eat, and the needy will lie down in security. I will destroy your root with famine, and it will kill off your survivors. Now he's talking to the Philistines. Remember, this is an oracle or a burden of the Philistines. And then he says, um, Wail, O gate, cry, O city, melt away, O Philistine, all of you. For smoke comes from the north, and there is no straggler in his ranks. Now, uh, I looked that phrase up also, and it's believed that he's talking about the Assyrians coming to destroy the Philistines. That's what it says. But that's open for interpretation. I think it fits with the text. It says in verse 32, how then will one answer the messengers of the nation that the Lord has found in Zion and the afflicted of his people will seek refuge in it? So um, it's really looking like that the answer to the messengers of this nation is Zion is going to stand. And so that fits also into this picture of this uh, statement here with uh, the rod and the serpent and the viper and the flying serpent, all one coming from the other. So, let's, is there any comments that anyone wants to make? Or we're just glad we got past those verses. <laughs> so, did anyone see anything else that they wanted to share? No? Okay. I'm with you, man. I mean, it's like, it was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, this makes a lot more sense. Right? It's just that, you know, I think about Isaiah's life. How long he lived. How many kings he prophesied over. How each king was different. Okay? They were different men. Uh, they had different relationships with God. And yet, there are certain connectors in Isaiah that make it consistent. And a lot of it has to do with the judgments of the nations. How God has treated each nation that has come against Israel or come against Judah has been consistently the same. So one of the things that I've had to do is look at how something keeps being repeated. And how in every other case, when we're talking about the... Um, prophecies of these Gentile nations, you do not see a fruitful result. You do not see one thing leading to the next thing leading to the next thing. They're judged. Bam. You know. Whereas things like this are not saying that. They're saying something totally different to me. So, okay. Let's go to the oracles, chapter 15 and 16. So, here is some background on um, on uh, Moab, okay? So, Garth is a um, town that refused to pay tribute to Assyria in 734, okay? Well, this is going to sound kind of wordy, but I'm just going to kind of help us look at some of the things that are being talked about. So, uh, in 720, they conspired with Egypt to defeat Assyria, but they were defeated at Gaza by Sargon II. This is Moab, okay? So, let me just write this down. 730, 
for G A R T H refused tribute to Assyria. And so 720, they conspired with Egypt to defeat Assyria. And uh, they were defeated at Gaza instead. by Sargon II. Now, in 711, this is, this is bad. So, a lot of times we forget that it's not just Judah or Israel that's at war with these other nations. There are other Gentile nations also at war with them at the same time. Because, okay, when we read back about the king of Assyria, I am over all the nations, they all bow to me, so on and so forth, and there's this list of all these towns. Those lists of towns were coming into Judah, but there's going to be lists of towns that are actually uh, Moabite and Philistine cities that Assyria is coming into and defeating. So uh, that's what he's, they're talking about here. Uh, they're defeated at Gaza by Sargon II in 715. Um, Ahaz dies. And then in 701 that we're getting to, Shennacherib invades. Shennacherib is invading not just Israel, not just Judah. Well, uh, Israel's gone. It's not just uh, going against um, uh, Israel. He's coming against Judah. He's coming against Moab. He's, he's, he's just, all the cities are being taken over. So chapter 15 is a picture of the results of Assyria's Dominance. Showing their dominance. Now, over Moab, but over all the nations. So, here we go. The oracle concerning Moab. Surely in a night, Ar of Moab is devastated and ruined. Surely in a night, Kir of Moab is devastated and ruined. Pretty straightforward. They've gone up to the temple and to Dibon, even the high places, to weep. Now, that, that's a very important little statement that we're going to come back to about Dibon. Moab wells over Nebo and, and Medeba. Everyone's head is bald and every beard is cut off. In their streets, they have girded themselves with sackcloth. On their housetops and in their squares, everyone is wailing, dissolved in tears. Heshbon and Eliach also cry out. Their voice is heard all the way to Jahaz. Therefore, the armed men of Moab cry aloud. His soul trembles within him. My heart cries out for Moab. His fugitives are as far as Zoar and El Elgath Shelehajah. For they go up, for they go up the ascent of Luhith, weeping. Show the road to Hor Horonoam. They raise a cry of distress over their ruin. So. What is interesting about verse 5? Whose heart is crying out for them? The who, who is giving the prophecy? So 15.5 It is God who cries for Moab. Now, what is it that we know about Moab? Genesis 
Genesis 19. Get the verse right. 30 through 38. What happens in Genesis 19? This is after. This is when the city of cities of Saul and Gomorrah have been destroyed. And Lot and his two daughters, right? Mm -hmm. This is Lot. Escape. And then what happens? They're hiding out in Zoar. And what do the daughters say? You know the story. They're going to be destroyed, and so they go in and lay with their father. And they each have a son. Mm -hmm. And the two sons were Moab and Ben. Mm -hmm. So when you see this verse right here, why is God crying for Moab? Who were they? They were the illegitimate offspring of Moab. But they were the family of Lot, who is uh, the cousin, uh, uh, nephew of Abraham. Abraham. So they were under, they could have been under the covenant of Abraham. They could have joined in. Listen, this happened in chapter 15 of Genesis, is when God called Abraham righteous in chapter 17. God uh, changed Abraham and Sarah's name and brought uh, circumcision. Chapter 18, he promised uh, Sarah a child of promise. Chapter 19 comes Lot and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't until I think chapter 21 or 22 that, uh, I think it's 22, where Abraham takes Isaac up to the Mount, Mount Moriah for sacrifice and God makes a covenant with him. How far was Lot and his family from Abraham? Not far. And where did they run to? Did they run to the tents of Abraham for protection? Mm -hmm. See, there's such a picture there. I mean, sometimes when we, when we see this, I, I just, I'm struck how God cries out for Moab. These are children that could have been a part of the covenant. Part of, the, part of the promise. But how do they treat Israel throughout their time when they were fleeing from uh, the Egyptians way back in, in Exodus? Moab was killing off the weaklings at the back of the, of the camp as they were trying to escape. Moab treated them very, very badly. So it sounds like, so he's, he's saying, I agree for them. For they go up the ascent of Luhith weeping, and surely on the road of this town, Horonarian, they raise a cry of distress over their ruin. For the waters of Nimrin are desolate. Surely the grass is withered, the tender grass died out. There is no green thing. Therefore the abundance which they have acquired and stored up, they carry off over the brook of Arabin. For the cry of distress has gone around the territory of Moab. Its well goes as far as Eglan, and its wailing even Beer Elim. For the waters of Dimon are full of blood. Surely I will bring added woes upon Dimon, a line upon the fugitives of Moab, and upon the remnant of the land. What is that a description of? Remember, this is the Oracle of Moab. And so, uh, what is an oracle? It's a burden. It's a heavy uh, statement against them. And so we see something that's happening here between God and these people. And uh, Dibon was the site of the temple of the Moabite god Cheshmosh. Chem Chemosh. Many of the people would go there to be well and cry over Chemosh's inability to save them. So they, they are crying, all right, the, the people cry. But they seek 
false gods. What should they have done instead? What would have been the, the right answer? What's the answer today? What do we want people to do today? Turn to God. The answer is to turn to God. This is what he is crying about because they had the opportunity. They were, they could have been taken in to Abraham's camp and they didn't do it. There's a whole separate teaching a lot that we could do that would be quite interesting. All right, so uh, I wrote a note here that I should read. From David to Ahaz, Philistine was a, at a disadvantage. Under Israel's thumb, once Ahaz came to power, Philistia had had the power and advantage. So from Ahaz forward, uh, the uh, Moabites, the Philistines and all that were had, were had a, a lot more power than they did before uh, his rule. I mean, at, until they had a lot more power until his rule was over. I think I just confused myself, but you know what I mean. At the end of Ahaz's rule, they grew in power and Israel and Judah decreased. So, chapter 16. Now, we know that in chapter 15 it says they're going to their false gods to seek uh, for help. Chapter 16, we're still in the oracle of Moab. It says, send the tribute lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah by way of the wilderness to the mountains of the daughter of Zion. What does that sound like? What are they doing? In chapter 16, they are sending, Moab is sending a tribute to Jerusalem. What they what we would want. It does sound like that, doesn't it? So uh, it says in verse two, then like fleeing birds or scattered nestlings, the daughters of Moab will be at the fords of the Arnon. Give us advice, make a decision, cast your shadow like night at high noon. Hide the outcasts, do not betray the fugitive. Let the outcasts of Moab stay with you. Be a hiding place of them from the destroyer. For the extortioners come to an end. Destruction has ceased. Oppressors have completely disappeared from the land. A throne will even be established in loving kindness, and a judge will sit on it in faithfulness in the tent of David. Moreover, he will seek justice and be prompted in righteousness. Okay, that just sounds very confusing right there. So, let me just say that verses uh, 2 and 3 and part of 4, the first two lines of part of 4, is talking about Judah protecting Moab, okay? So verse four, but it's giving a certain kind of um, qualifier, okay? And that is part of four and all of five is talking about, um, so we're going to say verse 4 and 5, is talking about the thousand year reign. That's what that's talking about. Because what's the difference? The extortioners come to an end, destruction has ceased, oppressors have completely disappeared from the land. That's not happening right now. Okay, that's not happening in the first part of this. But in that part, it is happening. Excuse me just a second. My phone keeps going off. It's my dad calling me. Let me turn this down. So you, sorry. So, so they're talking about the thousand year reign in verse 4 and 5. So 
Then in verse 6, it starts giving us some answers that maybe we didn't expect to see. Verse 6 is what? What's it talking about? <coughs> Your yeah. Yeah. 16, 6. Pride and arrogance of Moab. So it says, we have heard of the pride of Moab and excessive pride, even his arrogance, pride, and fury. His idle boasts are false. Therefore, Moab will well, everyone of Moab will well. You will moan for the raisin cakes of uh, Kir Parasheth as those who are utterly stricken. For the fields of Hezbon have withered and the vines of Shemba as well. The lords of the nations have trampled down his choice clusters, which reached as far as Jazir and wandered to the de deserts. Its tendrils spread themselves out and passes over the sea. So, what is he kind of, what does that sound like they're doing there? They are grasping. That's the only word. They're grasping. So, they are, it kind of appears like, okay. So when they did this uh, uh, send uh, a tribute, I made a note about that. Um, in historical times, uh, when they sent tributes to any nation, like they sent tributes to Samaria, they would send 100,000 lambs. So they sent, not just a lamb, but 100,000 lambs and uh, it was being sent to Jerusalem. So they were saying, we know that in Jerusalem the Lord may be found. That's what they're saying. But we see from the way that they behave that they're not willing to do exactly what God had called them to do, which was to repent, okay? So they're saying, oh yes, we know that you need this, and so on and so forth. Uh, but they're thinking that the giving of the 100,000 sheep or 100,000 lambs is going to appease God because what is their whole operation? How do people who have uh, faith in false gods, how do they operate? I mean, what do they it's think? Tat. It's tit for tat. It's all external, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, they believe if I, the bigger the gift, the better I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. Right? You give to get kind of concept. And this seems like almost as a sacrifice. It's given as a tribute, but it's almost as a sacrifice. Yeah. They're trying to get God's attention by giving him what they think mm -hmm. will make him happy. But yet none of their behavior <clears throat> matches the gift. Right. There's like a really serious, I mean, this is this is a very serious thing that's going on here. Well, in times of trouble, they revert to their former teachings. Yeah, you don't see you them know, running. They expect... Yeah, they have an expectation, and you don't see them running to, to Jerusalem. They don't run to Jerusalem for protection until the end times, okay, until the thousand-year reign. The only way they can be protected is through that. Uh, but up until that point, they are enemies, and all they want is relief from a bigger enemy. So when we think about the human nature that we're, we're looking at here, we think about the way people deal with things. Um, what does that say about their about Moab? Are they deserving of God's judgment? It's only expedient for the moment. Right. They don't even have an idea of what it would take to really bow the knee. What was the problem in Ahaz's reign? What kind of a king was he? A committed apostate. He didn't he he had plenty of things offered to him by the Lord. And by the way, this prophecy that we see here, the serpent, the viper, the flying serpent, that's an amazing statement of God's faithfulness. Because he's going to continue that line, even though that king was a committed apostate. He wants the same thing. He want, now, Moab is not going to have the gift of the uh, eternal covenant that uh, Israel had, or Judah had, because they refused to go under the umbrella of that. In other words, they could have been a part of it. 
Is there anybody excluded from salvation? I can't think of anybody. The only way that you get uh, excluded is if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, if you reject Christ as your Savior. That's how you don't get to go. So uh, it's the same thing for all of them. It's just that they are falling because of excessive pride. They're wailing over things that they consider to be what? Their summer fruits, their harvest, their uh, gladness and joy, all these things. This is verses 9 through 11. They're <coughs> crying over the loss of their wealth. Toilet paper comes to mind. Toilet paper comes to mind. You are exactly right. <coughs> so in 6, pride and arrogance is the problem. That's why they're falling. And verse 7 uh, they're going to wail. Everyone's going to wail. You're going to moan over your uh, raisin cakes, right? You're going to wail over the vines that are, not, are being trampled down. Uh, you're going to be upset about uh, all these things that you're being taken from you. You're going to bitterly weep over the vine and the, and the uh, fruits and the harvest and the gladness and joy, verse 10, taken away from the fruitful field. Uh, there's nobody making wine anymore. Therefore, my heart and tones like a harp for Moab, and my inward feelings for Harasheth. It's it's really sad, for I have made the shouting to cease. That's what God says in verse ten. Verse ten, God stops the celebration. Okay, because what's He trying to do? What's God's purpose for all of these nations? If he is crying over Moab, what is it he want from what is it that he wants from Moab? For them to turn back to him. Right. In verse eleven, it says, Therefore my heart and tongues like a harp for Moab, and my inward feelings for Kir Harash. For it will come about when Moab presents himself, when he wears himself upon his high place and comes to his sanctuary to pray, that he will not prevail. What is he doing there? In verse 12. What happens in verse 12? Read, read it carefully what he's saying. When Moab presents himself, when he wearies himself upon his high place. What's a high place? His high place. Let's think that that's the important thing. His high place. Yes, his high place and his sanctuary to pray. Where is he going? To the Bible. They're going to their own. Moab <clears throat> continues to worship. His gods. And the result is he will not prevail. And then verse 13 says, This is the word which the Lord spoke earlier concerning Moab. Alright, so he's saying, This is what I spoke before. Now the Lord speaks, saying, Within three years, as a hired man would count them. The glory of Moab will be degraded along with all his great population, and his remnant will be very small and impotent. Now that is pretty shocking, that within three years. So this is 715. We're talking maybe 718, 720. What's going to happen? They're going to be wiped out. 722, what happens over here? Uh, Israel is taken by the Assyrians. Moab is before you get to Israel. So Moab is taken out before Israel is taken out. So think about this. Moab is now taken out of the way. They have no chance. That 100,000 sheep they sent, they didn't do anything good, did it? They lost. This is the outcome. 13 and 14 is the outcome of Moab, what's going to happen to him? 
They're going to be degraded. They're going to be very small. They're going to be completely defeated. Now, 17 and 18, the oracle of Damascus. Where is Damascus? He's in Syria. Okay. So, the oracle is concerning Damascus. This is also described in 2 Samuel 8, 5 and 6. These are other references. And 2 Kings 16, 9 and further. It goes on beyond verse 9. So, uh, and then Jeremiah 49, 24 through 27, is a cross-reference to Isaiah 17, okay? So, uh, Damascus will be removed from being a city. That is a very end-time statement, isn't it? <laughs> So, verse uh, 3. Uh, this is, verse 3 happens 10 years later when the Assyrians come in 722 BC. So, it says the fortified cities will disappear from Ephraim, and that is uh, Israel, and sovereignty from Damascus and the remnant of Aram. It will be like the glory of the sons of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, the 722 that come to Israel in this fortified city is, is kind of taken out. And that's not saying that this is not the ultimate destruction, okay? And then verses 4 through 6, I kind of had to separate this out in my mind so I could kind of understand it. Um, it says, now in that day the glory of Jacob will fade. Now that's what we're talking about. What we're talking about over here, this part, and, and over here, this this uh, 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 this prophecy right here is referring back to this. They're going to fade. That's that's the that's the whole point of that. So uh, he says the, there are good things and there are bad things. So verse four, four through six are the glory of of. Uh, Jacob fades, 17, 4 through 6. This is a bad thing. Okay. This is not something that you want to see happen, but it's going to happen. Um, and then it goes on to say, uh, now, in that day, the glow of J Jacob will fade, and the fatness of his flesh will become lean. They're going to be starving. And it will, even, it will be even like the reaper gathering the standing grains as his arm harvests the ears, or it will be like one gleaning ears of grain in the valley of Rephim. Yet lean will be left in it like the shaking of an olive tree, two or three olives at the topmost bough. That's a picture of the remnant, just a few left. Okay, four or five on the branches of a fruitful tree, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. In that day, men will have regard for his maker. That's a good thing. And his eyes will look to the Holy One of Israel. So, so what happens in uh, four through six, the glory fades, 
the olive tree is a picture of a remnant. And then it says in verse 7 through 8, what's going to happen there? It says, men will have regard for his maker, and he will not have regard for the altars of the work of his hands, nor will he look to that which his fingers have made, even the ashram and incense stands. So what is he talking about there? Man turns away from idols and turns to the Lord. Now, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Why does God allow pandemics? <clears throat> so they'll turn away from themselves and turn to Him. This is one of the important reasons why the church needs to be the answer and not running with all the chickens with their heads cut off. It's not that we want to be foolish. It's not that we want to put ourselves at risk. I mean, we don't want to infect somebody else with this coronavirus or any of that stuff. But we're supposed to be the answer to the problem, not a part of it, because we have a hope. We have a way. We have a way out. We have. We we cannot exhibit. I mean, we can we exhibit faith, faith, but we have to have faith. We have to walk in faith. First of all, to the, these prophecies are given at a time when what's going on with King Ahaz? I mean, he, died, he is dying, but he is losing repeatedly, right? He's losing people. He's losing land. Uh, he is continuing to turn to others, anything that like God for help. He, he is just absolutely rejecting the salvation freely offered to him. Um, and the result is he only was king for 15 years. You know, it's not very long to be king. And he died at a time when God said, okay, now you're gone. Everything's going to be declining from here on out. And uh, what, what a testimony to his rulership was that. You know, we're all so worried about history and what we're going to look like in the future and stuff like that. Uh, he obviously was not worried enough about that to think about whether or not his life was honoring to God. And it definitely was not. So uh, the good thing is they're gonna. This is a good thing. This is a happy face. I'll just put a little happy face here. <laughs> okay. So I then we, yeah, finally a happy face. At least one. So then we get to. Uh, Basically, uh, 9 through 11. Get this joint around. And then from 9 through 11, it says, In that day, the strong cities will be like forsaken places in the forest, or like branches which they have abandoned before the sons of Israel, and the land will be a desolation. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore you plant delightful plants and set them with vine slips of a strange God. In the day that you plant it, you carefully fence it in. And in the morning, you bring your seed to blossom. But the harvest will be a heap in the day of sickness and incurable pain. Oh my goodness. So what they're doing <clears throat> is totally futile. What is he talking about here? Man is turning away, but then what does he do? What does he do? And you forgot the Lord. It got better, so you forgot the Lord. Because it got better. So isn't that what we do? Exactly. We forget why it got better. Exactly. Oh, it's where we're shooting. Oh, he said the crisis is over. Let's go back to normal life. And then what we do? Yes, it is. Of course, it is what we do. It's exactly what we do. Yeah. Oh, better. Got my bills paid off. Now I can go charge some more on my car. Yeah. <laughs> I can pay it off this time. I'm telling you the things that we think about. 
I mean, it's, it's crazy. It, it's just like, we just hate to see it. I hate to see that kind of thing happen. So, we get to 12 through 14. This is very interesting to me. It says, Alas, the uproar of many nations, or many people, or many nations who roar like the roaring of the seas and the rumbling of nations, who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. The nations rumble on like the rumbling of many waters, but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like chaff in the mountains before the wind or like a whirling dust before a gale. At evening time, behold, there is terror. Before morning, they are no more. Such will be the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who pillage us. What is he saying there? The Lord will rebuke. So we'll make that a happy face. <laughs> All right. So I had this whole uh, I had this whole list of Psalm 106. I would I took uh, 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 Psalm 106 for my for my own notes, and I, I probably I didn't put it in this, and I probably should have. But uh, reading Psalm 106 was really good. Picture of what is being talked about in uh, chapter 17 of Isaiah. Okay. Well, thank goodness that we've only got seven verses, right? In chapter 18. <laughs> okay. Chapter 18 is about what? Ethiopia. So chapter 18 looks to be about salvation of the Gentiles. That's what it looks like to me as we read it. It says, Alas, O land of wearing, wearing, how do you say it, wings. Uh, one of the commentators I, I looked at said, the tsetse fly, little buzzing flies, <laughs> which lie beyond the rivers of Cush, which sends invoice by the sea, even in papyrus vessels on the surface of the waters, go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth, to a people feared far and wide, a powerful and oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide. All you inhabitants of the world and dwellers of, on earth, as soon as the standard is raised on the mountain, you will see it, and as soon as the trumpet is blown, you will hear it. For thus the Lord has told me, I will look from my dwelling place quietly, like dazzling heat in the sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For before the harvest, as soon as the bud blossoms and the flower becomes a ripening grape, then he will cut off the sprigs and pruning knives and remove and cut away the spreading branches. They will be left together for mountain birds of prey and for the beasts of the earth. And the birds of prey will spend the summer feeding on them, and all the beasts of the earth will spread, spend harvest time on them. At that time, a gift of homage will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth, even from a people feared far and wide, a powerful and oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, even Mount Zion. What is that talking about? And why would we think that there is a salvation at the end of that? What did they do in the last verse? So they bring sacrifice. 
to Jerusalem or to Zion. That's in verse 7. When do you think this chapter occurred? First of all, who's in it? Zion. Okay, it's Ethiopia, Cush, and Egypt, right? Okay. Okay, so Ethiopia today is southern Egypt, Sudan, and northern Ethiopia and the Arabian Peninsula. So that's kind of, let's say, the Sudan and southern Egypt. That's what the commentator guy said. I believe him. Uh, Kush is African, South African people. Uh, and also, they say part of Ye uh, uh, Yemen, but we'll just say Africa. And then it says, of course, we know where Egypt is. Um, there's some important things about the, this, um, this chapter, and we're going to look at them. Verse 3 says, the whole earth will hear the trumpet. When does that happen, do you think? The second coming? I think so. And then it says in verse 4, the dazzling sun from heaven is really compared to Revelation 19. So verse 4 is really Revelation 19, um, 17 and 18. The angel standing in heaven. Um, it's a millennial reign picture. This is end times. This is uh, worship. The true king. So, my goodness gracious, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> it was a lot. It's a lot, and it's going to be as we get through the oracles. It's going to be kind of like that because we don't. It's not that we don't want to spend a lot of time on oracles, but you could see how Isaiah could be like a three-year study. I mean, you could yeah, just absolutely. chunk it apart and just take, you know, years to study it. And and I think that that's part of the problem is that because it is so much, so many things going on, it can suddenly become really overwhelming. But what we really have to focus on, we have to look at these oracles. Why are these oracles important? What's the importance of the oracles? Why would God bother to put this in? Think about how we would think about that if we were receiving it. I'm receiving this letter as God's chosen people, and he's saying these things to me, which he is. What would what would be the we better clean up our act. <laughs> Part of it is cleaning up our act, but we always have the opportunity to clean up our act. And we can always be better than we were. But what is the other thing that it does for us? It's doing something for us. It started out with, do not rejoice. But it ends with, rejoice, basically. Because why are you going to rejoice? Because, turned back. because there is an end. And it, it's all going to get resolved. Now, I'm sure that because they, um, Israel, Judah, was looking for uh, God to save them without them making any changes in their life. That's the bottom line. They, they wanted to be delivered, but they didn't want to have to do anything to be delivered. Right? 
They want it on their terms. They want it on their terms. I want to keep doing the things I've been doing. I want to go to the places I've been going to. I don't want to have to sacrifice anything for God to change me uh, or change my circumstance. I don't want God to really change me because I think I'm pretty okay. But I, I, I would like him to change my situation that I'm in. So how does knowing these oracles help us to look at that attitude? We have that attitude. We do. We don't. None of us. We don't want to have to be inconvenienced, right? But looking at this, what does this tell us? <coughs> Without God, we're nothing. Without God, we're nothing. He doesn't miss a thing, <laughs> right? But what is this real heart towards us? He loves us. He, he loves us. And he wants he, us to keep coming. Yeah. He wants us to come. God cried over Moab. Do you think God cries over us? Oh, gosh, yes. Okay, so when we think about, uh, it started off talking about the committed apostate here. We spent since chapter 7 talking about this guy who just couldn't seem to understand how much God really loved him. God gave him all of these visions, and and and, and poor Isaiah, I, mean, I just don't know. I mean, 15 years of Isaiah going to him day after day, hey, yes, listen, God wants to be your God. He wants to take care of you. He wants to deliver you. It could be so much better. What is it that we take away from this, these, these uh, oracles, these heavy burdens that God has for the nations and for the world? He created all men. He set aside a certain group of people for one purpose. And we see it right here, the ultimate purpose, which is the Messiah. We see that. But he cries over all people and wants all people to be saved. He desires that none perish. That none perish. God so loved the world. That's why when we first started this lesson, one of the big things, or started this, this study, one of the biggest things that I see is that uh, it isn't knowledge that saves us. And it isn't knowledge that defeats us. It's whose we are. Do we love Jesus? Do we want to trust him? Do we seek him? Do we understand that he loves other people? He loves everybody. <clears throat> but he is going to bring these oracles because it's not for the purpose of destroying. Who's destroying themselves? The people. God doesn't destroy anybody. He's doing those things. And when we have hard things happening in our lives, our country is going through a difficult time. We're not the only country. It's worldwide. Mm -hmm. What is God saying? We all want to know. What is he saying? What does he mean? He means for us to turn to him. That's what he means. He means for people to bow the knee. And look, this is not a big time play. We go and we look in Revelation, study Revelation. There was a whole lot worse than this going on. And so uh, we just have to recognize that it's time for the church to grow up. I think what this reminds me, I think simply, this is so complicated, I think simply, but I think about my son Brad when he was like middle school age or so, and his room was a wreck. It was a mess. Just stuff was everywhere. I, and I'm talking about even like remnants of food everywhere. And so I just got all over him about that. And he said, okay, fine. And that kind of resonates with me because don't we do that towards God? Okay, fine. I'll do this all day. So I went into his room and on the outside it looks spectacular. I think he's done it. He's cleaned it up. Yay. But then later on I noticed that child had taken every piece of paper he could find and crammed it behind his dresser against the wall. And underneath his bed, it was all kinds of junk under there and the closet. But when you looked at the room and the tops of the furniture, that is so great. That, that is that's awesome. That can be an exception to our lives. Absolutely. That is. And that's what I think these people were saying, okay, fine, I'm going to do this. And then the but heart was the there. point. Totally missed the point. the whole thing. <laughs> Example. It's a fantastic example. I'm so glad you said that. I'm glad it's recorded. The thing that we want oh, to dear. ask, the thing that we want to ask ourselves is, um, what kind of way do we have about that? What are we stepping behind the what dresser? What are we stepping behind the dresser? <laughs> if we want to be helpful to other people, 
where do we need to be ourselves? I mean, I need to look at my own life and why do the things that God's called me to do. Where am I at? So, and we're just going to keep going through. And I think uh, we're going through chapter 23 next week, I think. But we'll be going back and forth. So don't, don't, uh, don't, don't be overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, I'm going to keep, we're going to keep recording here. We're, uh, the evening class has been, the, the church there has, has stopped the classes there this week and next week. And they'll probably the week after that. So as long as uh, we can keep coming here in the mornings and recording, if, if Daryl, poor Daryl. It's a mine doing it. Thank you, Daryl. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. much. So let's pray. Father, just Lord, we do lift up our country to you. We lift up the world and people all over the world who are suffering. And Father, let us not focus so much on our physical needs, whether the great vines are blooming whether the fields are full, but let us instead uh, humble our hearts and say, Lord, whatever within me needs to change, change it so that I can be more the person you call me to be. That, Lord, we would be the answer uh, through you alone. You're the one who has empowered us and protected us. And I do pray for the businesses of my business and other people's businesses that are ser seriously affected by this. But Lord, uh, more than that, I pray for us to be a nation that doesn't just send 100,000 sheep, but a nation that says, Lord, I need to change. I just thank you, Father. And I pray for those who are struggling with the need to change. God says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavenly. I can give you rest. I just thank you and praise you and glorify your holy name. In the name of Jesus.